Hello, Joey. Hi. Hi. Can you start by uh, introducing yourself, please? Sure. My name is Joey Terrell, and uh, I'm an artist, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm a native Angelino, okay. uh, second generation, <laughs> and uh, Chicano, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and you publish uh, Be Homeboy Beautiful? Oh, yeah, Ho Homeboy Beautiful ma magazine back okay. in 1978. And uh, I should start off by saying that it was always considered an art project, not a magazine that was going to be sustained or like the subscriptions or ongoing. Okay. So uh, it was an art piece in a magazine format. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so what inspired you to, to do that kind of magazine as, a, as an artwork? Well, like a lot of Chicano artists, we were always concerned with um, making art about our identities. And, uh, and for me, it was about my uh, sexual identity, uh, as well as uh, being Chicano. And in the 70s, um, you know, uh, there was a Chicano art scene, but it was sort of ignored or by the overall art infrastructure and the museums and galleries. And so we had our own world. Um, but there was a magazine that had done an article. Uh, it was called New West Magazine, and it was a uh, magazine that was geared towards the upper middle class, you know, wealthy. But it did this photo essay, a short photo essay, on cholas, homegirls. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, and I looked at it, and I thought it was terrible. I thought it was very condescending. Like, you know, they were, it was sort of like, look at these poor creatures. And it really kind of made me mad. So I thought, I'm going to do my own magazine. And I was going to do it with sarcasm and sort of, you know, this sort of underground humor, uh, looking at, you know, a, an upper middle class magazine, but through cholo or homeboy mm -hmm. sensibility. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking of magazines like House Beautiful. So I became okay. Homeboy Beautiful. Okay. Um, and in it, I wanted to look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the homophobia within homeboy culture, mm -hmm. as well as uh, explore some of the racial and uh, ethnic uh, dimensions of living in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the zine, you take the role of a reporter, yes. which is called Santos. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about this character? Sure. So in, in, the, first, in the first issue of the magazine, the debut issue, uh, that's me on the cover. And, um, and in the magazine, I envisioned it as uh, having a, um, a journalistic aspect. And uh, Santos was the name of this reporter who, uh, that, that was me and uh, that had heard about an underground homo homeboy party in East LA. And so I secretly took my camera and took photographs of this party and, um, and had and did a photo essay in the magazine. In the second issue of the magazine, um, which looked at East LA terrorism, um, which of course didn't exist, but the, the fear of the white dominant white culture of you know Latinos and Mexicans was so prevalent. I Santos, the reporter, once again does an expose where I follow some terrorist homeboys who go into Westwood and kidnap a white family, and we take them, kidnap them to East LA, and then we torture them. We force them to eat menudo, you know, and, and to watch. Spanish language TV and they're like oh no you know you know it was all in jest all in fun uh, it was it, it, to me it was in the spirit of like a, you know Monty Python's circus uh, John Waters films that was the sensibility that I was going for and uh, and we had a blast doing it all my friends had participated it was really fun and uh, and I made an addition of 100 each and they were sold at a couple of independent bookstores here in Los Angeles Chatterton's book books and uh, the soap plant in Soberland. So, um, and that's that's what we did. And in the second issue, I uh, I also had an article about uh, some homo homeboys who were upset about the first issue. They felt that the photo essay was exploited of them, and so they uh, take over 
the editorial offices of Homeboy Beautiful Magazine and demand that we represent them with their voices, their culture, their poetry, their art. Um, and that was actually taken from uh, the real life activism of feminists who in the early 70s had uh, taken over and did a demonstration at Ladies Home Journal Magazine in New York, which I thought was brilliant. I thought I loved that they did that. And Ladies Home Journal then has the, their next edition, they had a special section that looked at the concerns of the feminists. And so I was imitating that. And uh, I, I read that you were influenced by Dada magazine and, uh, and Mad magazine. Yeah, well, I, I was always a fan as a, as a kid and teenager or whatever of Mad magazine, you know, and, and, and all of the, the underlying humor. Uh, the parodies that they would do of films and characters and movies. Um, and then, you know, I loved comedy shows and, like I said, Monty Python and uh, John Waters films. And so um, that was my uh, sensibility. And then also in, this, in the 70s, in the late 70s, uh, there was a, a group of artists, um, one of my friends included Scott Armstrong from Immaculate Heart College, who did his own sort of Dada uh, art these little Dada uh, magazines called Science Holiday. And they were very um, non-specific and sort of you know, kooky and crazy. I, I had that sensibility, but the Homeboy Beautiful was definitely much more specific to homo homeboy culture, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, and can you tell us about um, your participation in the ASCO Collective? Yeah, so, you know, being a, being a young artist and uh, growing up in L.A. in the early 70s, um, you know, you, you heard in the audio, you heard about Osco and the work that they were doing. And I had actually met uh, Bronk um, and Mundo Mesa and, um, uh, at uh, one of the gay liberation dances that uh, we used to go to in Hollywood. And uh, I loved going to them because, uh, you know, if you were... You know, you, you, you didn't have to be over 18 to get in. And, uh, and I met a lot of young, creative teenagers. And, uh, and so through Bronk and, um, you know, and uh, Mundo Mesa, I uh, sort of started following them. And when, uh, so I got to meet, you know, Willie Hedlund and uh, Harry Gamboa, the rest of uh, Osco. And whenever they would do events, I would attend. And uh, a couple of times I was in their videos as well. But, uh, you know, always on the periphery. I was never a direct uh, member of Oscar. Uh, and that was fine with me. And because uh, and there, there were a number of us, like Teddy Sandoval uh, and myself, uh, even Jeff Wodeke and a few others that participated in Oscar uh, art performances or events. And, uh, and I'm, you know, still consider uh, you know Harry and Patsy uh, friends or we're friendly but we're not real real close but uh, yeah and I, and I realize now in retrospect looking back that uh, Osco was way ahead of its time and you know I think they they did great uh, work that uh, was uh, ignored uh, by an indifferent you know art infrastructure in LA and it's only been uh, over the last you know 10 years or so that finally they're starting to get recognition that they deserve and we can say that your your zine became a, a cult object because like uh, the American collective uh, will publish your the two, two issue yeah so ago, so in, over the last uh, you know, over the last eight years or so um, I've become aware that I have lived long enough to see this young, younger group of Latino academics and queer studies academics that have been investigating my work and they've reached out to me. And one of them, Professor Rob Hernandez, uh, had uh, emailed me and asked if I had heard of Maricon Collective. And I said that I, I hadn't. And he says, well, they've heard of you. Um, they're fans of your work. And uh, I knew that they were doing a club. And I went to that club, got them, and introduced myself to them. And we've been friends ever since. And uh, so, 
Two years ago, um, they had suggested that we reissue Home with Beautiful magazine for the LA Art Book Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was a crazy idea, but we did. And it was great. There was such a great response to it. Uh, we almost sold out. I had a few left. So I was very pleased. And, uh, and I continue to engage with uh, Rudy and Carlos from the Mario Conte Collective today. And there was some uh, other uh, queer in at this time? Queer uh, Chicano in, sorry? Uh, Maybe where, in New York or San Francisco? Where in, or, back in the 70s? Yeah. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't really know. I mean, so, but you know, there, there might have been, but I hadn't heard of anything. And so, um, you know, I, I, I haven't seen anything since that was comparable to that. There were, you know, sort of underground magazines for homeboys and, you know, and lowrider culture, lowrider magazine, Teen Angel, yes. you know, which I sort of parody somewhat in, yeah. in my magazine, but uh, there was another thing that was queer specific. And you used to look at Teen Angel magazine when you were younger. Do you, you know what, to be honest with you, the first the uh, time I did Homeboy Beautiful magazine, I had never seen Teen Angel. And it wasn't until after I did this that someone gave me some copies of Teen Angel. And I was like, oh my god, this is this was great, I loved it. And I realized, like, oh, there was some sort of a reflection of, uh, you know. But of course, very, very different in, in terms of what I was trying to do, trying to upset the whole genre. Can you tell us about uh what kind of artwork you produced at that time and how it, uh, this maybe changed uh, the way you make uh, art now too? Well, I was always, I was always a painter and painting, mm -hmm. and, um, and, but always concerned with uh, ethnic identity and sexual identity and where the two intersected or clashed. Uh, that was my strategy for making art. Um, there was also an, what was called the male art movement at the time, so I was involved with that, with making postcards, uh, mailing them to other artists, having them go ahead and alter them, mailing them back to me, having the United States government with, through the postal system you know, document the, the work. Um, and uh, when, uh, with Homeboy Beautiful, um, I was looking at, you know, trying to do something that was outside of the realm of you know, painting static art that hung on a wall. Um, I mean, since that time, I have worked in a variety of mediums, but I have continued to paint all along as well. And can you tell us about the reception of those? Uh, how, how did people react when you when you publish? Uh... Well, back, back in 78, um, the... Uh, a couple of the stores that I had gone to, the Soap Plant and uh, Chatterton's Books on uh, Vermont, were very receptive. Uh, Chatterton's Books especially uh, had a, uh, a section where they had sort of do-it-yourself um, um, little pamphlets and booklets of poetry and things that artists were doing. So Homeboy Beautiful kind of sat right there in that section. And, uh, and I did get a, a few people who had bought it and then would write me uh, because my address was in there, and they would write me and say how funny they thought it was and how much they liked it. Um, and a couple of those people are still friends to this day. Um, but for the most part, when they would sell, I really didn't know, you know, where they went and who took them. And of course, we didn't have the internet and social media like we do today. Um, but I also took it to Papa Box Bookstore in the West Side, mm -hmm. which was one of the major independent bookstores there, and went in and, you know, very proud of it. I said, here's my magazine. And the owner, he kind of looked at it and just went like this, and he said, this is crap, this is shit. We want to have this here forever. And I was so offended. I was like, he goes, this is not art. And I said, well, obviously, you don't know about Dada art. And I said, and you don't know about surrealist art. And you don't know about Monty Python. And, you know, I was just like, I was so upset. And I, I left there. And I thinking, oh, I'm never, ever going to go back to that store again. And I didn't. Can you tell us about this uh, identity um, um, claim that there is in, in Hope Boy Beautiful? And was it more complicated to be uh, queer as a Chicano? Yeah, it, it, it was back then because I was, I was part of the gay liberation movement here in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Um, I mean, as a teenager, I was on this uh, uh, 
the Speakers Bureau of the Gay Community Center, mm -hmm. uh, which was a was a Victorian house on Wilshire Boulevard at the time. Uh, and um, I was also a member of the youth group at Metropolitan Community Church. And uh, I was involved with the, you know, the uh, Christopher Street West uh, marches uh, commemorating the Stonewall riots. And, uh, but everything was sort of white identified. And uh, I was very interested in trying to get, you know, kids, especially young Latinos like from the East Side, uh, like myself, to participate. And, uh, and one year, I came up with the idea of making Maricon t-shirts, you know, Maricon being a slur that people used to hurl at us. And uh, we reappropriated it, and uh, my friend uh, Teddy Sandoval, another artist, we did a series of photographs where I made the t-shirts, um, posed with them, and then he did photographs and mailed them out again, mail art, uh, to folks all over the place. And, uh, and, and that was really fun, those were really good. All these years later, there's uh, new interests by this younger generation of queer Latinos, uh, and they're everywhere. Back in the 70s, I felt like we were so much more isolated and almost uh, like a secret society, underground society. Very different now. Thank you.